Welcome to Holly History, where we discuss what you want to hear. No fake news, no alternative facts. Just history, all the time. Hello and welcome to Holly History. Today will be just me, Nick, discussing a topic that is um, heartbreaking, controversial, uh, will invoke extreme arguments among groups of people throughout the globe and here even in the U.S., um, it's one that fascinates the human mind. I just think of, you know, when you pass on the interstate or on the highway, anytime you pass a car accident, you know, look at that term rubbernecking, right? We're turning around, we're looking for the accident instead of actually paying attention to what's going on in the front of us on the road. There's something about this topic that is quite similar to that, that humans, for whatever reason, we are drawn to it, we're fascinated by it, um, we find deep interest in it because I think at the end of the day, it both saddens us. We find inspiration in it sometimes, uh, in the harrowing stories of overcoming it. Um, the drama, the drama certainly attracts us. But I think at the end of the day, it goes back to this idea of terror. That this topic today that I'm going to be discussing, and hopefully a three-part series of, of episodes, it terrifies us that we as a species can do things like this. And uh, the topic is genocide. Um, Genocide, essentially, by the authors that uh, I'll be using a book called "Why Not Kill Them All," really for the basis of this this podcast by um, by Clark McCauley, who is a psychologist, and Daniel Chiro, who is a historical sociologist. Uh, it's kind of the essential work on genocide, in my personal opinion. I thoroughly enjoyed the work. It was really heart wrenching to read, but it approaches the study from a very scientific and historical standpoint. Uh, I like the fact that you get two different people with two different backgrounds working on the book. I think it brings a really unique perspective to that. But it's it's this terror that we could commit this as a species, I think, that really deep down we all want to reckon with, that we're capable of such awful deeds. In college, I took a political science class my freshman year, spring semester, uh, back in, I think it was, let's see here, 2010, year 2010, uh, at Geneseo, took a class called Politics of Genocide. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 8 o'clock in the morning. You can imagine as a freshman student, spring semester, uh, the challenges of waking up at 8 o'clock. I mean, today, that's no problem. I mean, here at Holly, we begin at 7.30, first class every day. Usually, you know, most people like to be in the door by 7. Um, but in college, you know, you're in that, that time frame of your life where waking up early is an absolute disaster. The class, though, itself... Being that early in the morning discussing such a difficult subject was often challenging, but I feel like by 20 minutes in, everybody was just listening to the professor, enjoying the works we read for their for the the material. But I think I remember talking to one of my classmates, uh, and this is a person that I was not like friends with before anything, and we were we bumped into each other on campus at one point, and we kind of asked each other, why why are we so why why are there so many people that want to take this course? Why are we so fascinated by such awful stories? I kind of have a positive view, I guess, on, on things I like to be a glass half full type of person. And I said, well, maybe it's because of all the, the stories of people overcoming it, you know, people overcoming and getting through these, these, these harrowing stories. And, you know, I guess I took a positive light to it. And he said something I'll never forget. And he said, I think it makes us uncomfortable and in some way oddly and terrifyingly fascinates us that humans can do this stuff, that we can, we can average people you know, fathers and, 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 you know, mothers in some cases, even throughout history, that, that average people who, who are loving and caring to people in their lives will commit such awful acts of violence against other groups of people. Now, genocide, essentially, and the authors of the book, Jerome McCauley, define it as, uh, like the word they use, the, uh, the phrases they use, killing by category, um, committing awful acts of, of, of death and violence by category. And they approach it in a really unique way, too. And I'm going to get into that in just a second. But, you know, think about when you were young and you remember classes on, on history and when you get to things like Adolf Hitler and the Nazis come up, right? And a lot of times you get these people that write it off, and genocides in general, it's just madness, right? Just insanity. The uncomfortable piece is that when you look at the research and you look at the people who commit these acts and you, you read books like Why Not Kill Them All, and you look at studies on genocide, that's just not the case. These people are not insane. The vast majority, it's very logical, rational, and 
After the fact, the perpetrators of genocide oftentimes will be able to rationally back up and provide evidence as to why what they did was justifiable. That'll be a large portion of this podcast too. That's just a kind of a, a taste of this. And so, again, I want to kind of always come back to this question of why does why are we so drawn to this? Why does it fascinate us? Look at look turn on your Netflix account. You turn on your Netflix account, you will find countless documentaries on Adolf Hitler, the Nazis. Just documentary on documentary um, on different pieces of the Third Reich and, and, and the Holocaust and why they perpetrated some of the things they did. It's all around us, and, and clearly it sells. Otherwise, people wouldn't you know, engage their time in these, uh, these endeavors. Um, and, and on the other hand, it may be the fact that it sells and people are interested in it, but on the other hand, people also realize it's a story that needs to be told. It's a story that needs to be out there. So again, the obvious point of history so that we can keep it from happening again. And then there's also the fact of remembrance, right? Looking back and remembering those stories that are both harrowing and want to make us hold on to the better piece of human nature in such a dark time. So I think those are some of the reasons, but we're going to come back and grapple with that question throughout this so the first thing that, that shocks you as we kind of get into the research is that um, genocidal acts are very common. They happen throughout history constantly. Um, our minds usually go to the Holocaust being the first and the most obvious one. It's the one that we're, we know the most about. But there are so many examples of them. And for the most part, like I said, that these are rational occurrences. These are not insane groups of people committing awful acts. These are rational occurrences that happen multiple times on different scales and in every part of the world. You would be hard pressed to go to any part of the world and not find throughout their history some kind of genocidal act. No people, no nation, no culture, are, and the, you know a lot of this is from the, what the authors argue in the book, are really exempt from being the victim of a genocide or the perpetrators of a genocide. If you go back far enough in history, you're going to find this stuff. Um, the 20th century ones are the ones we like to focus on the most because you know we really like to think that We've moved past this, I think, in the 20th century. That somehow, as humans, that you know, we've really overcome this this killing by category. And the 20th century showed us clearly that we're not even close. Some of the worst, actually, it's, you could probably say the worst by body count, by death count, the worst genocides in history happened during the 20th century. You know, within there's, there are people today who have tattoos in their arms. From the Holocaust, there are the, the sons and daughters, grandchildren of of, uh, of people who died in the Holocaust. There are even you know descendants of people who died in the Armenian genocide at the turn of the century, which is one that you know Turkey, um, the Ottoman former Ottoman Empire today, and we know as Turkey has not even come to acknowledge that it even happened. So these are some of the things that we want to grapple with in this show and talk about, and try to. You know, we're not going to focus so much on individual genocides. We'll use those as examples of some of the research that uh, Cheryl McCauley did, but we're not going to dive in for 20 to 30 minutes of time on the Holocaust, the Ar Armenian genocide, or different you know, scenarios and genocides like that. We'll use them as examples throughout the show. The book, like I said, looks at genocide from an extremely rational standpoint. And what's, what's, what's interesting is the authors, I'm going to read a quote here in just a second, in the most scientific way possible, I guess, is the best way to talk about this. Let me read you their, their, uh, their quote here. We suggest that representing ancient as well as modern examples of mass killing is important in demonstrating the normality of such violence. No continent, no century, no civilization is exempt from this behavior. So that's just a bit of what Cheryl McCauley kind of have to say about this. Um, I'm going to read you another one here in just a second. To approach it in a scientific manner, I think, is the best way to approach it, as, as they suggest, to find out, they, they talk about this in our patch, to find out why evil occurs, you have to understand this behavior as normal. Now, because it's normal, does that mean it's right? No. But it's, they suggest it as like, like a, a non-surprising behavior throughout human history that if given the right circumstances, is going to happen. Let me read you this other quote here. One need only look at the vast literature about, for example, the Armenian genocide to see how contentious an issue it remains to this day even though no serious historian doubts that something terrible did indeed happen. This does not mean that we ought, not, we ought to avoid all moral judgment when considering genocidal killings, but it does mean that without a general typology, we are too prone to see each example as a unique product of a few depraved individuals. Yet, 
It should become obvious genocidal events have been common enough to suggest they cannot be explained as some kind of deviant behavior. On the contrary, given the right circumstances, normal human beings are all too ready to kill by category. So there you have what I, I feel like is a perfect example that I tried to stumble through um, saying through the first couple couple minutes of the episode there. Uh, they, they, Cheryl McCauley put it best, that, that humans have given the right circumstances are really prone to this behavior if put on enough stressors and the wrong kind of leadership to lead to this sort of thing. Now they get to a kind of a brighter place at the end of the book that, you know, there is hope. And if humans, if this behavior is normal, why doesn't it happen more often? This is another question that we will grapple with later on throughout the podcast. And initially, I think one of the reasons that drew me to this book right in the few first pages was how they define genocide as killing by category. The United Nations defines genocide as any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, (coughs) excuse me, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and forcibly transferring the children of the group to another group. So what I like the authors did was, especially for students, when you when you teach this topic is they shrunk that definition down to killing by category. And that's also more of like a, a modern definition. For, uh, the UN obviously coming up with this following World War II and the Nuremberg trials and the disasters of the Holocaust. But one could definitely argue that war crimes, genocide, these things have happened throughout history constantly. Just sit down, start reading Julius Caesar and Call, and you'll see you know war crimes and various atrocities. History is full of them, and so Cheryl McCulley really, really get into that deeply. And they look back and they really argue that this behavior happens; it's not deviant, and the fact that it happens quite often throughout history indicates maybe is this part of our DNA if put under the right stressors. And the way that they study it is also useful because with topics such as these and genocides, you get into a lot of sensitive issues. I mentioned the Armenian genocide earlier. Turkey today to this day still denies that anything happened. Uh, A film came out in 2016 called The Promise, and it's the first real major work on the Armenian genocide. And before the movie was even released, there was over like 250,000 negative reviews on uh, IMDb, I believe. Yeah. And just trashing the film from people in Turkey and the movie hadn't even been released yet. So these are sensitive topics for people who, uh, whose ancestors are the victims and whose ancestors may have been the perpetrators. So it begs the question, you know, how do we remember such things? How do we teach these things to students today? Because people can become so angry about this topic. For example, the Armenian Genocide, World War I, you're talking well over 100 years ago now, the United States still will not acknowledge that that was a, a genocide and war crime uh, for, for various political, foreign relations reasons. Their definition of killing by category is useful because it's not always ethnic. It's not always religious. Uh, a lot of it can be ideology-based. If you look at the Soviet Union, and the authors get into this well, about how killing by category doesn't have to be fueled by a religious belief. It doesn't have to be fueled by an ethnic belief. It can be totally ideologically based. In the Soviet Union, you have some of the largest killing of the 20th century totally based on ideologies or threats to that that communist ideology and the power structure of the Soviet Union. One might also just totally write it off to Joseph Stalin. Uh, You could certainly make the case for that. But killing by category does not always have to be based around the typical things that we go to, which is usually ethnic or sometimes even religious-based. And the light part is towards the end of the work, they focus on ways to prevent genocide in the future. They focus on, is this going to continue happening? How can we fix this? That sort of nature. But I want to really focus on the underpinnings of the human nature behind all this. Sort of that conversation I had with my fellow student back in college. You know, why, why does this fascinate us? Why does it happen? And the authors do spend the majority of the work on that. I looked at a lot of other research in this topic. And I might reference it throughout the work uh, periodically, but nothing really explained it as well as why not kill them. Nothing really got into it as well. So I'm going to heavily lean on that. A little off topic, but there was a quote from a movie that came out a few years ago. I know I keep referencing movies. It must be just because we did the recent (laughs) movie episode on the podcast, but a movie called Fury. 
And Fury is about a tank crew at the end of World War II. It's a very violent film about the end of the, uh, the Second World War. It's an American tank crew going through Germany, I believe in 45, right in the spring. There's not much time left in the war. And they're facing fanatical resistance in some pockets from the Germans. Brad Pitt, the main character, brings this younger recruit, kind of a greenhorn, into this room full of Nazis that have committed suicide because they knew the Allies were coming. The kid kind of asks, why are you showing me this? And Brad Pitt just kind of turns and looks at him and says, ideals are peaceful, history is violent. It makes you kind of think about that a little bit. And I don't want to write history off as this, this violent conflict-based just bloodbath because that's not history in its entirety. Do you see a lot of that? Yeah. But it's also the same reason that, you know, when, when, the, when a plane lands, it's not news. When a plane crashes, it's news. It's, we kind of are drawn to this stuff. We're drawn to the violent, the, the different thing uh, in history like that. We're not drawn to the happy stories all the time. I'd also like to kind of flip that point because within these horrible genocidal stories of these mass killings, we are drawn to the silver lining inside of that. So maybe we are drawn to that little, that little shred of light in all the darkness that is the story of this human conflict. So let's look at the annals of history here. We look back at some of the older mass killings in the ancient world, people like Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, Attila the Hun. We have this tendency to sort of write this off as, oh, it's barbaric, it was a more violent world back then. It, those people just aren't like us. It's just what they did. It was normal. That behavior was normal. We really don't know those people. Troll and Macaulay have a view on this that I, I think I'm pretty solidly in their corner that in order to understand modern 20th century genocides, you have to learn and discuss the mass killings of the past. Those people, to a certain, there are, I mean, there are ancestors. History, I like to say, is always, it's the story of all of us. It's the human experience. And the reason they say you have to study those, those killings of the past, those mass genocides, is because in the 20th century, they make a very strong case, and I agree with this, that humans have become retribalized in the 20th century through various forms of things like nationalism. Uh, the First World War comes to mind, right? Germany's looking for its place in the sun. That today, in Europe today, with the European Union, you see a much more unity between these countries. A hundred years ago, World War One, that unity just was not there. Today, I'd argue, I'm an American citizen. I don't understand this probably as well as somebody from Europe would. I'd like to maybe sit them down and ask them this question. But if you pointed out to a German and um, somebody who was from France, you know, and asked them, you know, how are you similar? They could probably tell you ways that they were more similar than different in a lot of cases. Back in 1914, they probably would tell you more, much more ways they were different than similar um, for a variety of reasons. And the ideologies in the 20th century as well have retribalized this. Communism, fascism, you know, the great titan ideologies of the post-World War I world all the way up until 1945 with fascism. And then communism is going to last until 19, you know, the 1990s, well into the time I was born. These ideologies gripped and the nationalism seized on people to get them to do things in a lot of cases and retribalize almost like it was the ancient world. So in a way, these mass killings of the past do have some similarities with the mass killings of the 20th century. The main difference, why the 20th century is so awful is because the difference that we have from ancestors is now that we have an industrialized society, modern nation states with modern power to commit these killings. You basically take killing and you put it on steroids. Uh, killing at, at, in the 20th century is far more deadly than the ancient world. The motives are similar, but if you, if you really think about it, 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 look at World War I and all the industrialization led to the, the, the larger increase of casualties the Holocaust, Soviet purges, the atomic bomb. This is what can happen when the industrialized might of an entire nation focuses its energy on the execution of a group of people by category. Now, the atomic bomb is obviously, I threw that in there because it's a little different. But, I mean, you go into World War II with relatively similar technology to the First World War. But war has a way of, like, ramping up society to get it to do things way quicker. So you go into World War II in 1939, you know, I would probably argue it's much earlier than that, especially what's going on in China and Japan and Asia. So you go into the, the Second World War with, with technology relatively similar to the First World War. You come out of that war with a technology that is sophisticated enough and deadly enough to exterminate us as a species. That technology is still there. And even in larger numbers, I think we just have become so accustomed to it, we just forget that it's there. 
And I want to now go into, this will be the last part of our first episode, the how the authors lay out the conditions and motivations for genocide to occur. The ones that were taught, I think, in high school and sort of the first things that we gravitate to for genocide to occur and the causes are usually religion, class conflict, scapegoats, sometimes even geography or ethnicity, ethnicity being one of the more common ones, especially the 20th century. Um, these are not really their four conditions. They have to do with, with Cheryl McCauley's four conditions for genocide to occur. Uh, sometimes, and by the way, these four don't all have to occur in the same place. It's more of this one kind of is the condition for this genocide, this one. So sometimes, sometimes you get more than one. Sometimes they overlap too as well, and they're very similar. But I remember being taught kind of in high school and before, and sort of my own kind of conclusions Let's just take the Holocaust, for example. It's often stated that the Jewish population of Germany was a scapegoat for Hitler's, um, was a scapegoat for all the problems that Germany was going through following the First World War, and that Hitler was going to use that. When you dig into Mein Kampf, when you look at Hitler's ideology, um, and, and it was sometimes suggested that, you know, Hitler really didn't, maybe didn't believe this stuff. It was, they were just a scapegoat for him to gain power and to have sort of an outward projection of hatred for the German people so Hitler could kind of get, uh, get a means to his ends, it's really more complex than that. Hitler really believed this stuff. I'm a firm believer of that. If you look at some of the things he would talk about, he would talk about a work called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was released by the Russian secret police, I want to say, in 1906, 05, 04, as an excuse to persecute um, Jewish populations within Russia, Tsarist Russia, that is, is before the Soviet Union. And it basically stated that there was an international Jewish conspiracy pulling the strings in all these major countries. And the Russian intelligence agency even kind of came out and said, look, we kind of just, this was not real, it's fake. Hitler still believed it and bought into it. And that's Hitler's essential ideology is that there's an international Jewish conspiracy operating in, in, in most major countries. It's tied to Bolshevism and communism, you know, which explains his reason for invading the Soviet Union. But Hitler and, and the leaders of the 20th century for these ideologies, even Stalin and Mao, they all believed what they were selling. They all believed in their ideologies so much so that when they sold it to the people, the people were able to go out and commit what they did. So I really do believe in particular with the Holocaust and World War II, that the Jewish populations of Germany were, were much more than just a scapegoat for Germany's problems. Now, there's some truth to that narrative. Were the, were the Jews maybe seen as a scapegoat in Germany? Absolutely, by the, by the average person. Um, and if following World War I, the German uh, military actually does a study to see how, uh, how common Jewish service and membership in the armed forces of Germany was. They expected to find out that maybe Jewish people weren't serving enough in the armed forces during World War One. They weren't loyal enough. Their study actually found that Jewish Germans were were some of, but per capita, were the largest serving uh, group. Obviously, not by size, but per capita, when you break it down that way, the largest serving group in casualties of the German military. Uh, Jewish Germans served valiantly in World War One. You can go to battlefields in in Germany today. And, uh, and in other places in France and Flanders, not Germany. And you could see in these, these you know, you see stars of David on the, the gravestones. So that narrative really didn't have a lot of truth. But Hitler still, Mein Kampf, buys into this narrative. Um, and, and so these, I just want to stress how intense these ideologies were of the 20th century to get people to do these things. Hitler believed what he was selling. I really firmly believe that. And I think that the, the German people maybe had a different interpretation than him, but... The guy selling the product certainly believed in it. So the four, the, but the four conditions that the authors lay out for genocide are different in some ways, yet similar. The, the four, I'll go through them quickly because this is going to close out our first episode, are convenience is the first one, revenge, fear, and pollution. So I'm going to begin with convenience. Convenience is usually results in when one side in this, the, you know, the perpetrator and the victim, one side has to have much more power. That usually has to be evident for any genocide to happen, in large part because if you run up against, you know, a, a group of people you would like to exterminate, remove, and they're more powerful than you, it's not going to happen. It doesn't work that way. So convenience has to begin with one side kind of having more power than the other, and they're willing to use that power. That's also a piece of the story that's important. Um, the perpetrator has to be willing to use the power to commit the awful act. 
Sometimes you'll find throughout history that there are restraints and limitations placed on that. You'll see things like the you know peace movements. You'll see anti-war movements. Various examples. Usually, though, to achieve convenience is is a self-interested goal. It could be political gain or materials or resources. This this one, I always have a weird spin on the way I interpret things. I envision like a mafia boss. Um, you'll you remember you know things like Goodfellow. You know, it's just business. It's just business. It isn't personal. It's just business. That's what I think of when I was reading this passage about convenience being a motivator for mass killing. And usually, it's because one group has the power. This is easy, it's feasible, and they desire or want something, and the other group is an obstacle in the way to be removed. The best example of this uh, I see are indigenous peoples in North America and throughout the world uh, following colonization. For example, the United States, one only needs to look at the, the westward Indian wars um, and the Dawes Act, the Indians, the Indian boarding school system, um, things like Wounded Knee, the Wounded Knee Massacre, you know, there's there's so many examples. Native Americans were consistently seen in North America as an obstacle to be removed that was in the way of civilization and progress and consistently resulted in massacres of Native Americans throughout American history. You know, this is something that Americans have a hard time coming to grips with, but it happened. And that kind of goes back to that initial part that I was talking about earlier where perpetrator or victim, these are things that we have to come to to deal with in history. I was just at Geneseo Teachers uh, History Day, and I was talking to one of my old professors, uh, Michael Oberg, and he, you know, we were talking about how do you how do you reckon through things like this? And uh, Dr. Oberg is an expert in Native American history. I could listen to the guy all day. I really enjoyed, you know, taking class with him in college and writing my senior paper with him. And he said he looked at me and says, "You know, you're married now. You can you can use this as an analogy. You can either talk about problems you might have, or you can completely ignore them. Which one seems to work better?" And I think that's a great way to look at this when I read Sheryl McCulley. And when he said that, I was like, wow, it's so profound. Um, he's a much smarter guy than I am. It made me think, you know, we, we as Americans and even other countries, we can look at our history and we can ignore the differences we have or we can talk about them and sort of try to, you know, find, find the truth in those narratives and discuss those narratives. And the Mongols are another example I always think about with convenience, um, natural resources, uh, the you know just taking taking territory you know you can look at the Romans you can look at a lot of ancient groups for convenience I think it's it's easy it's convenient and there's a certain gain to be had but like I said in in U S history Native Americans are the are the first group that come to my mind when you you have the convenient narrative for genocide that this group's in the way we have more power than them. It's convenient for, to remove them, to move them somewhere else, or you know, massacres do just happen. Uh, those are all throughout American history. The next condition they lay out for genocide, and this one I think we can all kind of understand and get, is revenge. And it interests me because this leaves the perpetrator of the mass killing of the genocide with the best excuse for the act they're about to commit. Humans have long memories when it comes to history. Those memories can be correct, accurate, or incorrect. Just go down to Georgia today. Ask people about William Tecumseh Sherman. Now, I'm not sure, you know, you might have to find the right person, but um, they might get some pretty, pretty starch reactions. And it results in a desire to seek justice for those past wrongs. It's almost like the perpetrator feels that the victims, they just got it coming. They've got this coming. They've done something wrong to me and my group, so I have the right to go and do this. One of the things that the authors point out in Why Not Kill Them All is in 1937-38, in the Nanjing ring, uh, region of China, Japan committed some brutal acts. This is also a hotly debated um, genocide to this day. It's called the Rape of Nanking. Nanjing has a couple different names. We also studied it in my Politics of Genocide class in college as well. And it just has a long history between Japan and China uh, in all of their, their strife. But in the Second World War, you have the Japanese chasing the Chinese army back to Nanjing. When they arrive and the city is sort of left abandoned, the Japanese come in and they just lay waste to the area kind of as they see it as almost payback and justified for the past wrongs that happened in that war and before. And if you even bring honor into the question, which was certainly in the case of, of Japan and Nanking and Nanjing, 
if honor is into the question, the killing can be even worse when you violate that sense of honor depending on the culture. And it creates, it, it makes a distant past a current situation. Something that could have happened hundreds of years ago, decades ago, all of a sudden is now rehashed into the present and made violent. The Armenians in the First World War, a great example of that. They were consistently seen as a disloyal part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they also had different religion. They, the Armenians were predominantly Christian. The Ottoman Empire obviously being predominantly uh, Islamic. And they were always, the Armenians were always seen as a, a consistently disloyal part of the empire and an easy target for that reason. And when, that's, when, that, when the Armenian genocide began in, ni- in uh, 1914-15 in the First World War, when that started up, you have you know the, all these past wrongs being brought up from, from decades ago. And whether they're true or not doesn't matter. It's all about the perception of the revenge. I'm also reminded of this one clip we showed last year in our World Wars class of it was I might have been the late 80s, 90s. Uh, could have even been, I'm not even positive on this, but I do remember the clip well. You have these ex-German veterans from World War II, um, part of the the Wehrmacht, and they were fighting. Some of them fought in the East, got transferred to the West. None of them, to my knowledge, were you know, part of the Einsatzgruppen or anything like that, but they were members of the German army during World War II. They're in this museum of military history. They're talking about, this, the, the tour guides talking about World War II and sort of the motivations of the Nazis and, and things of that nature. And these guys had almost rehearsed propaganda lines of what to say to respond to what this tour guide was saying. And they were saying things like, oh, um, the, the Americans would have loved us because we were, we were going to be the barrier between communism and Bolshevism spreading west. The German army just didn't, they almost, they didn't do these things unless they were provoked. Uh, we, if we cleared out that village and killed non-combatants, it must have been because the non-combatants fired on the German army, so they're no longer non-combatants. I mean, they had rehearsed lines as to why the things they did were justified. And you often can talk to perpetrators of genocide and through interviews, and you'll see this, they have reasons as to why they did what they did. They have justifications. I mean, you think about it. You look at kids today in the lunchroom, during lunch duty all the time. Why did you do this, buddy? Well, he did it to me first or he did that. And, and I think that's a natural part of human, you know, the human mind is to seek revenge, to seek justice, to seek restitution for what has been done to you. And if you think about it, humans in general are far more likely to do nasty things if the enemy deserves it. If you think about public executions, Throughout history, these are events that are similar to sports games in some cases. Think about the Romans in the Colosseum. Europe, even in the Age of Enlightenment, when we believe that we as humans are becoming this new and uh, exciting thing, we're evolving more and more, we, the human mind is so powerful and we can do great things with the mind, but yet when we have public executions, you know, we're going to take the kids down for a nice evening and check it out. It's, it's, it's odd to think about. But if, if you really dig deep into it, you write that off as, oh, well, they're criminals. They did something awful. They have this coming. They deserve it. They're receiving punishment. They deserve it. So I guess when I read that revenge being one of the foundations, one of the four foundations to, for a genocide to occur, I wasn't all that surprised because revenge is really one of the core human motives when you think about it in, in average everyday life. It, the scale is obviously different, um, but to seek justice for a wrong done to you does does happen. The third motive, and another one similar to revenge that I think is core to human uh, the human mind is fear that Sharon McCauley lay out. The constant idea that if this threat to us is not eliminated, it could one day become this existential threat and the way of life we have could, could come and destroy us. The best example that my mind always gravitated to was uh, Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar, as he's trying to sort of up himself in the, a younger Julius Caesar, by the way, trying to up himself in, in the Roman political system, he, he writes these, these works, and he's a wonderful writer. He writes these works about how Gaul is dangerous. The Gauls could come back one day. The Gauls sacked Rome in some of its earliest times in the B.C. era. Um, they, it was very, very famous sacking. And, you know, you come up with the, the ancient Roman idea of, the Gauls are dangerous, right? They are people that could come back, swoop down at any point. And Caesar writes these things, and he's trying to stir up the Romans into, you know, give me a command. We'll, we'll take care of these Gauls once and for all. And that's where he makes uh, a large chunk of his name is in Gaul, 
and it's a it's a campaign of annihilation in a lot of cases to subdue the territory north to Rome. But he gets this command and he convinces people based on the fact that this is a threat that may not be here right now, but you know one day it could come back. So we should just take care of it now while we can. It certainly worked. Caesar had his campaign, makes it all the way to the shores of Britain, goes into Germania, builds his famous Rhine Bridge. I think fear is a powerful motive. Fear is something that certainly makes humans, and this is I'm not telling I'm not saying anything new here, but can make us do things that we wouldn't normally do. Uh, when we're not thinking clearly. We just in the nineteen we got in the nineteen twenties in my eighth grade class this week, and uh, my student teacher, Miss Parmalee, was talking about Sacco and Vansetti and how during the Red Scare, you know, people are afraid of immigrants. They're afraid of anarchists. They're afraid of communists. And these guys fit the bill for all three. And even though the evidence might not be solid, they look like the perfect scapegoat. That fear plays a powerful role in how people react, think, and what they're willing to do. And if you think about getting average people to do awful acts, this perhaps could be one of them. Um, Stalin, with his political fear. I mean, Stalin himself definitely saw enemies anywhere he went. Uh, if you became too good at your job, you could be a target. Now, this maybe is more fear on a personal level, but I think he and his cohort perhaps felt fear of this guy, this group could potentially pose a threat to my power. He, you know, Stalin could use this fear in a variety of ways. One example of this is are the, the purges to the military on the eve of World War II. Now, Stalin clearly probably thought Hitler was not going to attack him. They had the non-aggression pact. You know, that maybe is a little foolish for Stalin because if you read Mein Kampf, Hitler talks about Liebesraum, which is, you know, living space for the German people. We'll get it in the East at the expense of, you know, those people. And Stalin, I mean, I got to believe he knew that that was said in Mein Kampf. But when Operation Barbarossa comes rolling through the, the western part of the Soviet Union, Stalin is, is, is beside himself. He didn't think it would happen. So on the eve of World War II, Stalin purges his officer corps. He, he's fearful that they may be thinking about taking over uh, the country. He, he trumps up fake charges, and the, he stirs up enough fear in the people that he's able to either um, you know exile a lot of these people or even execute them, most notably Mikhail Tukhachevsky, who excuse me if I butchered that name, who was the head of the Soviet army, modernized the heck out of it, probably bears a lot of the credit for the Soviet forces doing pretty well at the beginning of the Second World War. Um, I'm sorry, doing very well throughout the Second World War. But if you know anything about history in that, that time period, the Soviet forces really struggled early on, in a large part because Stalin was so fearful that he, com he had these great officers who just got rid of them. And that's not uncommon throughout history when you see Somebody is fearful of seizing power over somebody else. That that idea of extermination or mass killing comes into play. So so far we have convenience uh, as our first motive of genocide from the authors, revenge, and then fear. And now we come to the last one, which is pollution, and not pollution in the environmental sense, obviously. But this one is, I'm just going to throw it out there, the most fascinating, and because I think it's the hardest to understand. I'm going to spend a little more time on this than the other ones because the author suggests that when this happens, when this idea of pollution comes into play of mass killing, these are the most deadly ones. The other three motives can be rolled into this one, but this one, when it happens, is it, it leads to the most deadly killing, and I think it's the, the most popular of the 20th century. I think it's the most extreme because it usually plays on religious, ethnic along those lines, um, can be class and ideological as well. And it appears in the form, and this is where fear comes in, of another group as that, that moral threat to the purity of your ideology, your ethnicity, your religion. It has a moral underpinning there. It's, the, it's that just that strong idea that anything could pollute our purity of religion, ideology, class, ethnic group, that anything will pollute that 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 soul, just core identity, that threat needs to be eliminated. And I know I might keep coming back to this example, but the best example of this idea of pollution and purity is, is clearly Adolf Hitler, that Jewish people and other groups were such a threat to his ideology and, and the racial purity of the German that he sought to dehumanize these people. In or and that's an important part of the equation. We can't forget that, that in order to get his populations to go along with us and participate in these killings, he needed to dehumanize these people. And he did this through, you know, Goebbels and his propaganda and, and all those people surrounding him. Um, Jews were not the sole scapegoat for Hitler. 
they were the sole problem. And if you look at if you look at World War II, Hitler will often and the German High Command will often divert crucial resources that the German army needs at the front to continue the Holocaust, to continue the extermination of groups of people. This guy really believed in what he was doing, and that was the top problem. The Jewish problem was the top problem. It was not necessarily the, the war. He needed to continue this, this idea of purity and to get rid of this pollution of the other. And, and so that's why I mentioned earlier, and, and I touched on this, that they weren't just a scapegoat and a means to an end. They were the sole problem. And I want to read you a passage from the book, uh, Why Not Kill Them All, by Chiro McCulley, that, that talks about this, this idea of racial purity for the Nazis, for Hitler. And it's, it's a bit long, but I think it does a really good job of, of explaining this idea of pollution and purity. Here it goes. In a way, this disbelief is similar to the rationalizing of some German historians who claim that, that Nazi racial genocide was a defensive reaction to Soviet-class genocide. Such a claim is only plausible if one neglects Hitler's very deep aversion to and fear of Jews. It was the merit of the psychologist Walter Langer's classified wartime study of Adolf Hitler's mentality to point out the many mention in Hitler's writings of the fear of disease, of pollution, of corruption, and the degeneracy, all of them ascribed to racial mixing and particularly to the Jewish disease. Hitler himself was perfectly clear on this. He wrote in Mein Kampf, blood mixture and the result of drop in racial level is the sole cause of the dying out of old cultures. For men do not perish as a result of lost wars, but by the loss of that force of resistance which is contained only in pure blood. And in one of his most famous passages, this is Hitler again, with satanic joy in his face, the black-haired Jewish youth lurks in, the, in, lurks in waiting, for the unsuspecting girl whom he defiles with his blood, thus stealing her from her people. With every means, he tries to destroy the racial foundations of the people he has set out to subjugate. This, this is now the authors again. There may have been a lot of pseudoscientific eugenics in Hitler's ideology, yet these and many other passages in his writings and speeches indicate that his horror of Jews was not merely misunderstood Darwinism, but was linked to an obsessive search for purity. And that ends the quote right there. So as you can see, the author subscribed to that too, that Hitler was definitely buying what he was selling, this, this obsessive search as they use the, it's a great phrase. Um, and I love the two passages that, that they pulled out. And they cite other authors in that. They're not the only people to, to point this out. They actually kind of you know, looked at other works and, and sort of incorporated this ideal. But Hitler was obsessed with that sense of, of, of search for purity and the pollution of others was a direct threat to that. If you look at the 16th century and the Catholic Protestant wars in Europe, there were some of the worst, most horrible acts that I don't even want to repeat out loud um, committed to even the bodies after people had died um, because it was such a threat to religious purity um, of people. So this idea of purity that anything can threaten what I am seeking to make pure is very, very deadly. In another sense, now we'll go to ideology, right? So we kind of had some, some racial purity there with Adolf Hitler and religious purity as an example. Now, uh, another ideological purity. In the Soviet Union and China, you have leaders like Mao and Stalin, and they were so convinced, and you can also kind of throw Pol Pot into this too, and there's probably others down the line, that their ideology was the right one, that any time that ideology was threatened by, you know, maybe a plan not working, a five-year plan not going the right way, you know, parts of the Great Leap Forward, that any time that ideology was threatened or anybody questioned it, that group or that person was quickly eliminated, that any threat to the pollution of that ideology was simply gone. Those people were often used as, you know, oh, the, my policy is not working because of this group, and it's like a perfect escape route. Like I've been talking about kind of earlier, this idea of, you know, did, did these guys believe what they were selling? And yeah, they definitely believed it. You know, I just talked about the Nazis sending, you know, valuable supplies away from the front. That, and that's an existential thing, too, that they were so committed to their idea of, of purity and uh, getting rid of pollution. And ideological killings tend to be far more deadly, too, because you can't always see an ideology. You can't always see a threat to an ideology. Ethnically, sometimes you can identify things if it's people of color, Native Americans, in some cases in the United States. And the authors talk about how, you know, Pol Pot, Mao, the ideological killings 
since it's hard to identify who your threat is a lot of times because one cannot enter the mind of another clearly that you begin to just exterminate people who don't even fit the bill of the threat to your own ideology because in the 20th century i there i remember this conversation it was on bill maher's uh, show late at night and he had on i think it was a, a catholic writer Bill Maher was talking about some of his stuff from his movie Religious List. Reli- I can't even say it out loud. I, religiouslessness, something like that effect. And he was talking about how religion and motivates people to do awful things throughout history. And then if you look at history, religion is the motivation of all these awful things. And the person and, and the, the, the Catholic writer says to him, well, certainly not in the 20th century, Bill. He pointed out the, the ideological killings of you know fascism, Pol Pot, um, the Soviet Union, different things like that and and he kind of said like you know 20th century is not it's more ideological killings and i think these ones fascinate me the most because i think in the past throughout history you can see the religious killings talk about the 16th century ones a little bit religion was definitely a motivator but it almost transitioned the 20th century that these political ideologies a lot of cases or racial ideologies that they almost become like new religions, and it all reinforces the earlier argument of retribalization that uh, Jerome McCauley make in their book. It all sort of hits on their idea of that the human um, human species in the 20th century, through nationalism and ideologies, has become retribalized, which led to these killings. That these ideologies are almost a new religion. They're a huge motivator for war and killing, and so that kind of was a little bit of a surprise to me that ideology can become one's religion even if it's totally secular and can motivate you to do things that many people are like, oh yeah, I could see somebody committing an awful act for their religion, for their moral code. But what about for a leader? Or what about for a leader's ideology that they're selling? It's something new to think about. So we're going to kind of stop there today um, for the the first part of the Genocide Podcast Probably a bit heavy, but we got through the four the four uh, conditions of genocide. In the next segment, we'll talk about how that if humans are willing to do this, you know, why isn't it more common? You know, why doesn't it happen more often? It certainly happens quite a bit throughout history, but you know, why why isn't it happening more often? And uh, then we'll get into probably the most difficult part to discuss. But how do you get one human to do this to another human? That part of the book. Probably, I probably spent the most time on because it was the most maybe shocking to me, was the most thought provoking. So I want to thank you for listening today um, to Holly History. Make sure that you you know you subscribe to the page. We're trying to get an Apple iTunes hopefully soon. Uh, we can we can get that going. Thanks to to Tyler Jones for the wonderful artwork that he's been doing for us. Some shows in the future we're looking to do. We're probably looking to get some students in here. Uh, this is kind of the busy time of the season for for everybody in the history department here at Holly to sit down and talk and podcast. That's why you're hearing only, hearing only me because the spring is just wild um, for everybody in the, in the school, and so it, it gets to be a little bit challenging. But we hope you tune in to part two and part three of this series, which should be out sometime next month. Uh, thank you for listening. Make sure you can, you can email us questions. You can tweet us uh, at uh, Holly History on Twitter. And, uh, well, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the next series.